Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time. This is Leadership and Legal Live with myself, Steve Lois, and attorney James Reed. James, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here and looking forward to a uh, fun debate with a, a new, pr- new sheriff in town. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second. So for everybody who's watching, we are streaming on Zoom. We are on LinkedIn Live. And we're also on Facebook Live. So if you have comments, if you want to ask questions, uh, feel free to join in on any of these platforms. Uh, This is our first one of 2021. And the whole purpose behind Leadership and Legal is we let you, the audience, ask James and I and other guests at times any question you want that that pertains to human resources, the leadership side of that, and anything legal because we know that we live in a world of legal issues, James. That's why you're here, plus the leadership experience that you have. Job security. It's good, it's good for you. So for anybody watching this, again, the, the target audience is, is HR professionals, business professionals, leaders, and so forth. And in a couple of ways that you can contribute, you can ask questions right here through Zoom. You can ask using the chat button down at the bottom. You can ask questions on LinkedIn Live. Uh, I am not monitoring Facebook Live today. I think a member of our team is. So if you post questions there, there may be a little bit of a delay in actually uh, getting involved. So we got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today, James. And that's why there's no additional guest. In light of 2020 and something that you just referenced, there's a new sheriff in town. I'm excited. There is a ton of material. And I think we'll have new information every time we do this as well. Well, let's kind of talk about the new sheriff. Obviously, our our president was inaugurated yesterday. There's 17 or so executive orders already signed. From From a legal perspective, are you hearing of things that are coming down the pike or has something already happened that as business leaders or HR professionals that we really need to pay attention to? Yeah, Biden rolled out his plan for 2021 in the employment world. And one of the first items on his plan was minimum wage is $15 an hour across the board. So, and there's no longer a tip to minimum wage ever again. And there's a lot, you know, increasing unemployment, an extra $400, all this additional stimulus money. So there are a, a lot of pro employee perks. So, so how does that differ from the, the previous administration kind of big picture and then you know, what, what companies that currently don't have a, a minimum wage at $15 an hour, how long do they have in order to get it to, to where it needs to be? So the plan has not yet been finalized. We're actively on our team analyzing it. But to go back to Michigan, um, you know, the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. Michigan slowly, the Republicans actually made laws slowly increasing Michigan's over five years to not have Democrats make it 15 so quickly. So there's this uh, slow scale, slowly going toward 15. There is not any guarantee it will hit 15 uh, this year. And I think it would be unlikely to have a plan that would require that this year. But in a nutshell, under the Trump administration, uh, there were a lot of procedures and rules that were benefiting business owners and employers by minimizing the more frivolous employment claims, whether it's, you know, people claiming they have union rights in a non-union company Mm. or a lot of, you know, decision makers would err on the side of keep businesses operate. Now, under the Biden administration, it's a lot more focused on um, the employees and making sure that they are taking care of more so than what the market demands have already naturally allowed. So there's some things for for employers to start thinking about, even though it may not happen right away. I mean, getting counsel on this stuff, having conversation about it, preparing, because at some point in the next four years, these things are going to happen no matter what. Exactly. And he actually signed an executive order yesterday that was the biggest executive order in the history of the world in protecting LGBTQ rights and kind of consolidating all the recent Supreme Court decisions uh, that we spoke about last July. So, so is that something that as organizations, as employers, that we've got to make sure that we're prepared for right now, given that it was already signed through executive order? 
Yes. Uh, like legally, you're not required to have your handbook updated based on yesterday's executive order, but in reality, you do on it because social media is so powerful in this day and age. If you don't have a message to your employees or your customers that you are either on board, you know, with the plan or what's your response to what's going on outside of the workplace, you can't just ignore the BLM movement, LGBTQ or politics. You have to sometimes take a stand or explain what your company policy is. Yeah, we talked a lot about that last year. If you, ha if you, if you haven't seen some of the previous Leadership and Legal Lives with, with James and I and other guests that we specifically talked about that, go back and look at some of the archives where we, where we have that conversation. Because you got, if, you, if you stand for nothing, you're gonna get slaughtered in social media. If you stand for something, you better be able to back it up. So it's kind of a, it's a difficult situation for some employers to be in. It's a very challenging time. Whenever there's change, it's super challenging because you have to learn the, the new rules of the game. And we could spend a whole hour. There's five key different employment areas that Biden wants to change uh, during his tenure of president that could maybe be a, its own category. So, so let, at least mention the five, James. We've got a number of questions I want to get to, but put those five out there. So if we have questions that come through over the next few weeks before our next live one, if you've got some thoughts on at least a couple of those, that you think are going to be hot topics, bring them up and, and we'll we'll shelve it for the next conversation. Sure. Um, so th just to be organized, NLRA rights are going to apply to all private employers more than ever. There's going to be strengthened things to the Affordable Care Act. There's going to be increases to employee leave of absent rights and independent contractors uh, are going to have more rights to get unemployment and have other perks or potentially overtime, and then minimum wage. Those are the top five things expected under the Biden administration. I mean, that affects CEOs, that affects CHROs, that affects employees, that inflect in, the employer. It, it basically impacts everybody. So if you've got questions on those five topics, and we're going to hit a couple of those kind of today, but we've kind of saved up some of these questions that we've received over the past three weeks from, from viewers that we have out there. So let, let me dump in, and I'm going to kind of kind of jump in here. I'm going to kind of bring up something that you've already addressed, but I'm going to read these questions as I do. You've got a copy of them, James Verbatim, but but let's let's go down this new sheriff in town a little bit more. Look, I can't help but be disturbed by the worsening political divisions in the country, and I worry about it spilling over into the workplace. I'm not confident anything will pass or blow over even now that the election is over. More and more companies and leaders are taking sides on these issues. Should I do the same? That, that's just a little bit of what we were just talking about right now. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of the Last Dance series it's all of Michael Jordan. And Michael <laughs> Jordan said, you know, uh, Republicans and Democrats buy shoes. And he, he didn't want to take a, a strong stance. I think it really depends on the customer base and the culture of your company, who your target client is and who you're advertising to. And, you know, in some scenarios, you may want to take a stand, but I think in most you would want to welcome different political views within your organization so everyone feels comfortable and, and welcome to share their thoughts. Because I'm sure as you could talk about, most conflict could be healthy conflict and having a healthy debate to understand people better. Yeah, we, we were actually talking about that this morning in a leadership group that I, that I was leading. It was, I, with the, the concept was put yourself in their shoes, right? Doesn't mean you have to agree with somebody who's got a different view, whether it's political or, or something else. But put yourself in their shoes and start asking questions why they have a certain stance. That's where conflict can be healthy. My opinion has been this past year, much of the conflict that's out there has been very unhealthy because, and I'm not just talking politically, any side on the opposing side seems to be more focused on litigating like an attorney and arguing as opposed to truly understanding the other side. And, and that's not really the way to lead an organization, at least from, from my opinion, what I've seen. I agree. I'd even go one step further and say the, the trend I'm seeing is bad mouthing the other side instead of supporting your own side. So what does, that, in your, what does that mean for HR, James? I mean, HR is like in the middle, right? HR, you've got, you've got factions within an organization, whether, and, and again, let's take out polit political, just anything where there's different viewpoints are. And eventually that boils up to HR. That's, that's got to be a significant challenge, even more so than it's ever been before for HR professionals coming through 20. And what's that going to look like in 21 from, from, your, from your perspective? 
it is a massive challenge, but what I'm seeing most private employers, so if you're not a government employer, you can actually restrict political talk in the workplace and even in most states in their personal life. So uh, even Dinsmore and Scholl, our, our law firm, we got a message from HR and the CEO saying we are not to share our political viewpoints on social media or internally in the workplace with anybody. And if you do, we'll take appropriate action. So how, how is that related to, you know, we want to stand our ground, though, on one form or the other. And, but then on that side, we're saying, hey, let's not say anything. So how do those two jive? Basically, uh, you want to encourage your company to share their ideas, but you can tell them not to talk about politics because it is too disruptive and too problematic in most companies. And, you know, at our law firm, uh, half the clients could be on one side or the other. So you don't want to make certain companies no longer affiliate with us because one attorney that didn't, isn't speaking on behalf of the company. And I think that's the issue is that if you were to go on Facebook, Steve, and share your political view, it would appear that it's on behalf of your company based yeah. on your leadership position. And I think if a certain lower level employee did it, you wouldn't necessarily think the company also agrees necessarily with that viewpoint. So I think we got to revisit our social media policies and be extra clear that we're not speaking on behalf of the brand of our employer, because right now, uh, people that disagree with the, with the post will actually find out where they work and send complaints to that employer. So I have right now people calling me, people have been fired for random social media people not liking what they're posting and, and calling the employer and, and boycotting business. Yeah, the I mean, we talked about again uh, the cancel culture. We we had a lot of conversation with it, yeah. with it last year as well. I would encourage you to look up some of the archives on on leadership and legal where but this is a real thing that's going on. Kind of parlaying off of what you just said, I, I was watching a movie with my family not last night, the night before. It's it's an old '80s movie, and now there's a disclaimer in front of that movie. I don't know if you've seen this, James, where it's you know we don't necessarily subscribe to the content or the views within this. I've never seen this disclaimer before. It's the first time ever, um, especially around racial and other comments that happen within the movie. So they're saying, we're distancing ourselves, but at the same time they're saying, but we're gonna play it for you so you can watch it <laughs> anyway. Right, I mean, right. it's an extreme view of this, but, but it's like, boy, we gotta be really careful what's being said and how it's actually being said because it, it's a ripple effect that affects our organization and by 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 uh, affiliation, all of our teams. You got exactly nail on the head. Yep. So second question that's kind of along the same vein that, we, again, we've had a lot of conversation about BLM. You mentioned BLM today. Here's the question. In the wake of BLM, companies have spent billions on diversity and inclusion and at many times with little to show for it. It's a long process. We get that. I see the value in diversity, but I can't help feel like it's a money pit for an organization. When does it stop? I've ad-libbed a little bit. I don't want to abandon our diversity inclusion efforts, and I don't think you should, but I don't want to throw money down the drain either. What are your thoughts on that statement? It is going to be one of the hottest issues of 2021. I actually had a call from a prominent attorney yesterday, and he said my client was a white male executive that was fired, James, you know what's going on in the country, uh, you know, with diversity and inclusion, can you pay this employee six months severance? And I, I said, why? And he said, well, you know what's going on in the world, so can you give him six months severance? Not he didn't even have any factual allegations that the company, you know, made someone unqualified over him or that, you know, there were no performance issues, just What's going on in the world? Any white male now that has ever replaced or let go, apparently plaintiff attorneys are salivating trying to bring lawsuits now uh, on that basis alone. But you're right, the fear is, you know, we have a, a diversity and inclusion expert at our firm, Tammy Bennett, and she would say we, diversity and inclusion is not just filling it with a minority or a woman. You wanna fill it with somebody that is extremely qualified and has a different viewpoint. We don't wanna have uh, I, different races and genders, but every single person has the exact same personality trait and skill set and way of speaking. We want to have different styles that mesh together and ideally have different, you know, um, relationships where we can improve the ROI. So I, it has to be part of your return on investment plan 
and it can't just be checking the box, filling a minority or a woman. You actually have to have skills behind it. Yeah, and that's that's where I think you know the, the companies have spent billions, maybe it's millions. I don't know if billions is actually accurate. I think companies are going to continue to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on this because they need to figure out how to do it right. Because I do think you've got, to your point, James, there's camps out there that are, you know, we, we don't have diversity, so now let, let's go find a bunch of minorities to say we're a diverse organization. But yet, are you setting them up for success if you're putting them in the wrong roles just so you can say we're a very diverse organization? And I don't think a lot of the programs that are out there and companies big and small have really figured out how to do that successfully yet. So yes, that is a place I think we'll continue to see heavy, heavy, heavy investment because I don't think anybody's got it right yet. I, don't, I haven't seen, I think there's some organizations that are doing it well, but I don't think anybody's got, anybody's doing it right right now. And, and obviously the climate that we came out of in 2019 and 20 has proven that in, from, from a, just a, a general perspective, let alone an employer's perspective. So you know, they don't want to throw any money down the drain. Don't. Don't spend money just on putting your token African-American or your token female or what have you. Spend money on getting to the right population that challenges your culture, not just adds to who you already are, because that's where the diversity of mind thought comes in and reach the people in, in those areas where they operate and so forth. Don't just keep hiring people that you happen to know because you're comfortable with it. It's a complete mind shift change, and it's going to take. I think it's going to take another 10, 15 years to get there. That's my personal opinion. Uh, absolutely, it's definitely a, a progress, not perfection. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. So, a um, cu couple of other things going on. I mean, there's a lot of questions on here that are related to HR. It seems like HR is in the middle of this whole thing, as I mentioned. HR professionals play a big role in this. They they are they are challenged, and they're challenged in resources. They're challenged in responsibilities and all that. So here's one of the questions, James. How can HR support a healthy work-life balance as we near a full year of people working from home, babysitting kids while sending emails, et cetera? What does HR do? That's a great open-ended question. And this is where HR can shine. So I was just talking to someone that says they're lucky in HR, they report to the CEO so they can share their vision and their ideas. But most HR reports to the CFO. And they say there's this battle where the CFO is always trying to cut their budget and minimize expenses, especially when there's a pandemic. So they have less money and they have to do more things to help people's mental health and, you know, working remotely and in person and balancing childcare, school, et cetera. So essentially they have to find the non-monetary ways to help their employees, which may be more of flexibility in their schedule, or maybe they can work different hours as long as they get their work done, uh, more remote work, less in-person work and in certain uh, opportunities. They can actually be part of a continuous improvement committee or they, they use, they take surveys. So a lot of HR have been taking surveys. What would you like an employee to, to be happier? And maybe, yeah. you know, they can do other things, um, you know, spend time with their, their pets, pet insurance, uh, there's other creative ways to have paid time off that doesn't cost the company uh, any more time. So really, it's just checking in. But I think your wellness plan, people are tapping into their wellness plan more than ever with whether it's exercise, encouraging, you know, other type of wellness help. Because right now, people's mental health suicide is a 300% increase. Yeah. Let, um, um, Joe, I'll get to your question here in a second. I'll come back to that. But here, here's... Here's kind of my, my thoughts around this HR thing. I think it's unfair to put all of this on HR, first of all, because they're, they're stuck in the middle, right? They, they've got to kind of keep the employer happy. They've got to keep the employees happy and so forth. I think, it, I think one of the most valuable roles HR can play is the influencer right now, because they can't touch every employee in a large organization. They can only touch them through the hiring leaders and providing support and influence to the hiring leaders to better connect with their teams. I think this is where kind of the HR and the leadership piece has to really, really come together. And there's some HR professionals here specifically in Metro Detroit that are doing this really well and providing the support to the leaders so that it kind of cascades down because HR can't do it all. I just, I think it's impossible. It absolutely is. And I agree. I was, they're training their employees to answer surveys and provide the solution because HR can't do it all. 
and I see HR teaming up with a committee where they're working with the CEO and CFO and the other C-suite and as a team finding a way to make things better. Yeah, and if you're if you're a CEO, you're a leader and you've got you've got the head of HR reporting to you, it's time to go back to that head of HR and say, how can my team better work with you to take and get all that information out, to better connect with our team members, provide us some guidance, but let us go do some of that work. I don't expect you to do it all on your own. I think I think that's an important kind of distinction around this piece because that work life blend, I don't even call it balance anymore. Different people are at different points in their careers. Sometimes that blend is heavy in career. Sometimes right now that blend is heavy at home because I got kids at home, whatever the case might be. Uh, James, go back for a second. Joe, Joe had a question. Do employees have recourse if they post and are fired? Free speech, question mark. The answer is no. You can fire someone for their political posts as, as long as it's a private employment related job and not a government job because the First Amendment right to free speech only applies in the government context. So you can have free speech out, out in the protest from things in, from the police and the government, but it doesn't protect you in private employment. The other nuance to that potentially is if you're posting not political stuff, but trying to say, I wish I had more sick days, I wish my employer accommodated me more, that could be that union speech that is the newer trend of protected speech, even if you're in a non-union company. But those rights only apply to positions beneath the supervisor. If you're a supervisor or above, you have to wear the manager hat and you can't actually use that speech against the company. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a commonly misinterpreted the, the the amendment around freedom of speech. I could do it anywhere, say anything, and so on. But when you're talking private employment, as you described, you don't necessarily have that right because you're connected to an organization within the confines of that organization. You you don't you can be censored, limited, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, because you are a brand or an extension of the company, even outside of working hours. So if you were you know, inappropriately. Wait a say that again? So if, you're, if you get caught cheating on your spouse, you could be fired for that as well. Really? Or if you're on the news for, uh, you know, being a internet stalker or, you know, abusing, getting in a bar fight with somebody, you could be fired for that as well. So, so what I do in my personal life, I could get fired for in my professional life. Correct. There's no rights to privacy in most states. I think California is like a different country they protect some privacy, sure. but no, um, you can say, out, you can have an outside conduct policy. We expect you to act professionally and represent our brand 24 seven. Okay, so what if you don't have an, an outside policy like that? Can you still fire? And, and is, that, is that something that you suggest employers build into their handbooks and so on? I recommend if that's important to you to include it in your handbook. You could still fire if it's not in your handbook, but the risk that you run is if an employee's ever surprised, like even you were a little bit surprised at how extreme, I just gave a couple examples. Yeah. You might then, if you feel cheated, is when you then look at ways to get revenge against your employer and whether it's maybe I'm suing because I was trying to start a union or I was trying, I'm a white man and there's other women that are still there. Like that's when these frivolous claims happen and these frivolous claims still have a economic value and a nuisance to the company that's gonna cost attorney fees, time, it's gonna hurt the culture, it's gonna to have to depose people, it gets, and social media damages. So there's a value to everything. So I, I don't want you to surprise your employee. You know, as Marcus Buckingham would say, the number one most important thing is for the employees to know the rules of the game. Yeah. And I think number two is to utilize their strengths. E expectations we, we know are key. If you know the expectations, and you don't meet them or you break them, that's one thing. If you don't know the expectations, technically you can't always claim stupid, but you can say, I didn't know, and, and, and maybe sometimes you don't know. And it, so that, I that, probably give a warning, but yeah. you know, it's kind of like what you could get away with in the 70s, 80s, and 90s now with social media and cameras, <laughs> it's harder to get away from, so you can't ignore it. It's gonna be there forever. I, I, there were so many stories of employers firing people back in the 90, late, late 90s and the 2000s as, as social really started to come, come about. And I, I, I can still picture it. Guy calls in sick. I think this was in Canada. Guy calls in sick, says he can't go to work. All of a sudden, there's pictures of him in a, um, in a 
fairy costume at a Halloween party getting smashed that night. <laughs> right. And his, his boss e- sends him an email saying, don't worry, you don't have to ever come back in again. I'm glad that you're feeling better or something to that effect. And that's been all, there, there, it's like 3 million hits on the internet now for that particular picture. You got you, you to be careful. You no, know, it's like the day after Super Bowl, everyone's sick. You know, <laughs> what were you doing the night before, right? I wasn't sick. <laughs> right. I, sh- I showed up on Monday morning nice. after this. Anyways, uh, yeah. let, let's let's get a little bit serious. So so we've had there's been so many pressures and the employees that stayed with their organization this past year and a half with the pandemic or last you know year with pandemic. But even prior to that, there's a lot of talk and there seems to be a lot of pent up energy about, OK, looking for the next opportunity now in 2021. So there's kind of two parts to this question that came up. Um, how how should HR leaders in businesses prepare for what the, what they believe is going to be a deluge of turnover in 2021? And do you even see that, that from your perspective, legal and leadership, do you see that happening in 2021? I see it definitely happening. I was actually on a call earlier today with you know, 20 CHRO jobs that are open and people wanting to change their next opportunity. So my concern is uh, not only does HR have the stresses of turnover, they're actually potentially looking for their own turnover if they're not getting the support that they need and they're not being heard in the way that they want to be heard. So I think this definitely does have to be evaluated. And I would love to get your viewpoint on loyalty. I think a lot of people that have been at a place forever aren't necessarily rewarded more because to attract that new talent, sometimes you have to give them additional perks, not less perks. And it makes that loyal employee feel, you know, I'm taking advantage of. Yeah, we, we've been actually surveying a lot of this in, in current employees and, and wondering, you know, how are they thinking about stuff? And you always have the internal equity issue, right? If somebody has been with an organization for 20 years and then you've got, you know, the new kid on the block coming in with five years of experience, there's a real there's a real situation where often you have to give that new person more than I think the question is, okay, does that current person deserve more or equal to because of the value they've brought to your organization? You know, there's, some, there's some things you need to consider based on that internal equity issue, but those that have been there for a long period of time also need to understand that the market has changed and give your employer some time to figure out what's the way to build that equity for both of those individuals. I think that's kind of one piece to it. Um, the other turn, I, I see the turnover happening as well, but I see it for a little bit of a different reason. Um, it, 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 there's what I call a kind of a social contract out there between employee and employer. And, and, and what's, what's happened in 2020 from the feedback that we're getting is a lot of these employers have looked at their, a lot of these employees have looked at their employer and the crisis of 2020 in the minds of some of these employees has showed who their employer really is. And it's not so much a pay issue. It's not so much a title issue. It is a, they, you know, the the crisis is the great exaggerator. And that great exaggerator showed some serious problems in their mind with those particular employers. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that's happening right now that's causing people to start looking in 2021. 100%. When you're in a crisis, you get to see the the true side of your leaders. Yeah, good and bad, because the ones that are good, I think they're really getting the accolades. And the ones that are have some questionable tendencies, that's where that's where this turnover is happening. And, and I guess it goes to your previous question, but I'll or your previous comments, but I'll ask it again. You know, how do we prepare for what's so we we've established 2021, we're gonna have turnover as an organization, the counsel you're giving your clients, the counsel that you're giving to potentially HR professionals and so on, what do they do to prepare? I think this virtual chat is causing a problem because you aren't able to see their, you know, body language and you're getting coffee at the water cooler and getting to spend some time with them. So all of this silence outside of these scheduled meetings, you're like, what does my boss really think of me? Is he notice this thing where I went above and beyond? Oh, he couldn't notice it because he's not there. And I feel there's less loyalty than there's ever been before. And I think that, what HR needs to do is figure out how to get that loyalty back and somehow personalize um, who your employees are, maybe check in with them, see, see what's bothering them, how you can help them and help. Now's a great time. What is your 2021 goals for yourself as an employee? 
because I've seen employees sue saying, my boss didn't teach me my trajectory. I felt I was in a dead end job forever. And employees are expecting kind of a, a coach uh, how to help them continue advancing in their career. And I think we need to train our managers. They may not know how to do that personal touch and check in when they're overwhelmed, just trying to hit their you know budget numbers for the quarter. Yeah, you bring up a good point. There's a, there's a significant difference. We, I, we've talked about this before too, of you know, managing is managing kind of a process. Leading is about influencing people. The only way you can influence people is to have some kind of connection with people. So I think one of the ways to prepare is to make sure our leaders and managers, to your point, are trained on the art of influence, which is all about cr creating some level of connection with your entire team. And, and, and to your point as well, having those clear expectations. But you, what's happening is I see a lot of people defaulting to, yes, clear expectations. So I want to put 13 metrics on you, James, for your work as an attorney. <laughs> and they don't do the connection piece. That doesn't work. You got to do them both at the same time. At least that's what I've seen. I agree. I, I think silence, people assume the worst. And there's two types of employees. Well, those that speak their mind and those that say nothing and then just find another job. So I want to go back to a, to a legal stuff. I should have asked this question. I apologize. I'm, I'm going to come back to it um, because when we were chatting at the end of last year, uh, James, you were talking about potential legal precedent based on cases that were working their way through the system regarding things like COVID, things, you know, some of these other things that we've talked about. Have there been any significant cases in 2020 that you can make us all aware of that either support some of these things we're talking about, raise additional questions, but specific situations that have arisen that we need to be paying attention to? Great question. And in a nutshell, there hasn't been as much as we thought there would be. Most of the lawsuits, about a thousand of them, are actually employers suing their insurance company with some type of COVID you know, uh, pandemic insurance. There's also shareholders suing the companies for not taking action quick enough to you know maximize uh company decisions so as far as employee lawsuits they're relatively smaller they're basically just under 100 i saw related to wage and hour claims with getting paid properly and working enough hours at home and punching the clock there's another several hundred on you know trying to bring a workers compensation claim that hasn't really been successful or claiming my employer didn't protect me enough. So some, you know, $7,000 fine, OSHA violations, but there really hasn't been much of substance. What is pr projected in 2021 is that there will be systematic discrimination cases on the rise. And es essentially what this is, is that you didn't uh, violate the law by laying off Joe, but we can look at the pattern and the people you selected are either older most of the time or a certain gender or a certain race and we're going to prove through math that you unconsciously through your data uh singled out a certain protected class and have class action lawsuits based on that so unconscious bias is really going to the next level potentially in 2021 by far uh, all the plaintiff attorneys that i'm talking to they are very adamant that there's systematic discrimination going on, whether we know it or not. Every employer is responsible. As you said earlier, no employer is perfect yet. Yeah. Uh, so as a result, they're going to continue to press home that theme. And if you recall, a few years ago, every company that was over 100 employees actually had to file for the first time ever an EE01 report that identified race and yeah. gender and national origin and the rate of pay essentially. And so they could evaluate if there was systematically a, a difference. So it may be a great time for the CFO and HR to work together and just do a, a rough audit to see how it would look on, on social media if you revealed you know, your internal uh, operations. Okay, so let, let's say that that's the case. Let's say uh, unconsciously um, we, made a, we made these decisions to hire this pattern of individual and, and so forth. And now we want to get ahead of the game. What do we do? So there's a bunch of case law that says you can always fix things and that can't be used against you. So anything you do to, to fix, um, to encourage it, there's actually a court rule right on it. So like if you got in a car accident, there's no stop sign there, but you put up a stop sign the next day, that can't be used against you. You're always allowed to, to fix 
the situation. So um, I would look at things and potentially give certain people, you know, raises if, if you think that uh, they sh are worthy of that raise and, uh, you know, make changes slowly over time. The, the situation that you just described, could it also work against you where um, you're kind of admitting that you did something and now you're trying to fix it? Could that be construed in a different way legally? Culturally, yes. Social media, yes. But legally, you're actually not allowed to bring in the after the fact evidence. The only thing relevant is what happened, you know, up until the alleged uh, damage situation. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, it's a, we live we live in an interesting time for for sure. <laughs> so, from a for, what do you see as the other kind of big issues in terms of legal for 2021 that HR really needs to be looking at? We've talked about a number of these kind of big picture things that we've been hearing about in 2020. But let's go beyond that. Are there some other things that you see as an attorney that maybe we're missing because we're so enthralled with or we're so focused on racism and some of the other big picture stuff that we're talking about? Well, the big piece is um, we expected more employees to come back to work in person in 2020. So that hasn't actually happened yet for a majority of employers. So once they're back in person, that's when we're going to see all these claims that Joe didn't sanitize the coffee pot. That person didn't, you know, uh, wipe down the refrigerator. And that's when all HR is going to have a nightmare getting way more complaints from all the employees, especially now that they know their political views from social media or mm. other things. There's going to be a, a morale, culture, combative issue, but they're also going to blame, uh, you know, COVID health issues by not, you know, providing a safe and healthy work environment. So that's going to continue to be a disaster in 2021 for many companies as what I see as the main thing, in addition to now employees think they're entitled more so than ever. So every employee thinks essentially that, you know, they can't be fired at will. They think they're a four cause employee and if they're not treated fairly or they think their, their leader is not being soft enough with pillow gloves toward them, they now report that as discrimination. So I probably have had more discrimination reports than I've ever had in the history of my career in this past year. Really? Because they think they don't like the tone that their leader is talking to them when they're stressed out or when someone maybe is missing certain assignments or data. So this tone now is discrimination. If, if I have a bad tone, my boss is discriminating against me. Yeah. But, but when I unpeel the onion, it's not because of their race or their personality or their religion. It's because... They're not getting the work done, and that same leader would be a tough coach on everyone on their team if that was the same performance that leader was getting. I, I was going to say, is there is there truly validity to those kind of claims, or are you seeing those getting tossed out, or is it too soon to tell? They get tossed out 100% of the time, but it usually costs the company five grand to, to toss them out. So if you get a lot of those, it, it creates issues. Un unfortunately, for a small business, it could potentially – tear down a business if it gets to that point. But then you got to ask the question, if you've got so many employees in a small business saying the same thing, is there some truth in what they're saying in the first place? I'm getting the same uh, plaintiff attorney representing three different employees from the same company. Like, what's going on? How toxic is, is that employer's culture and workplace? That, that doesn't make HR's job any easier. That just creates more of a... HR should be focused on how do we get, more, how do we get the best out of, our, out of our team versus dealing with all the issues um, somehow we got to figure out, figure that piece out. It, it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's always functioning the right way. I think the issue is there's lack of a paper trail right now with all these social media or, you know, virtual chats, we're not really recording minutes. We're not really um, putting uh, stuff in people's personnel file at the office. So now I have employees that say, give me my personnel file. Well, no one's been to the office. There's it's empty. So, uh, I, you know, that's true. Oh my gosh. Right? I didn't even think of that. So I think we got to train our leadership on how to, you know, if we're having performance issues, how do we document that and get it in at least a virtual personnel file so that when they ask, we can consolidate all of our notes together. So I just, I got a, a text just a second ago, um, kind of along this path as well. Here in Michigan, um, our governor has opened up restaurants, I think, as of February 1st. But the, the question is being asked, can employees go back to work in offices or is that still on hiatus given the way the order was written or is being written? It's still on hiatus. Uh, if you can, as long as you can, you know, reasonably do your work remotely, uh, you're still required to do so. Do you, do you see so, that continuing throughout the entire year? 
I, I see it likely continuing at least until June when I think by then the average person should have the ability to get vaccinated. But uh, however, though, I'm seeing more companies um, taking the approach that you need to be at work. So like- That you do need to be at work? That you do. So okay. like even, so just to give you an example, like my legal assistant, you know, could she uh, do, do stuff at her house? Yes, but she can't operate our printing machines from her house. She can't, you know, help me stay organized and, and do things remotely. So you can make the argument that at least a few days a week or on a part-time basis, you're actually required to be in the office. So I'm seeing a lot more companies take that interpretation in order to slowly encourage their employees to get back to work. So completely off the things that we've been talking about, completely off. Yes. HR and the subject of artificial intelligence and technology. And let me, let me give you some context behind, and mm -hmm. I know who actually put this down, so there's some context behind it. Tools to select candidates that are supposed to be unbiased, proving to be biased. And we've seen last year, beginning of last year, Google had a tool that there was some question about. I know it's completely off subject, but it's, but it's a question here. Yeah. What's the legalities of using technology to make the majority of the selection about candidates as opposed to selection committees and, and so on? Do you, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, there's actually a ton of articles and case law on this topic. And essentially, uh, once you have, let's say, a thousand people go through that uh, you know, questionnaire and you single out a high percentage of minorities or women or other protected classes, if the delta is off 20% of what the averages should be, uh, then that's a basis to sue and that would be an illegal test. So in order to not risk being off on that 20% margin when you're analyzing how it impacts various protected classes, because some of the questions may have unconscious bias where they're you know, directed toward a, a you know, male figure about would you rather use your hands in construction or would you rather play it with a doll and wear a dress? Like those, some of these questions have some gender built into it. So in order to, to minimize that risk, you should only have that test be at, at maximum one third of the factoring decision into your process. So, you know, take that as one third of the category, not let it do your work for you. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting on how do you, how are some of these tools being created to determine these are the things you should be looking for in the first place, right? That's where the bias comes in, where there's, there's a whole nother suite of tools based on people analytics that says, let's go and look at the best performing people of any race, any background, any color within these functions at this company, and then determine from that the general skills and competencies needed. Because the, the, the other argument that I'm hearing is, you know, hiring leaders say, hey, I want the things that are on the job description. Is that in and of itself already biased? Because you think that's what you need to do the job. But the, the, the fact of the matter is the people that are most successful don't have those things. It's causing right. all kinds of potential issues. It's a huge issue. That's, that's another headache for HR. HR is told to fill this VP job and they guess what they think the job description is. But once they're hired, they're, they aren't doing the majority of those things. So I think it's really important to have a diverse board. And when I say diverse, it doesn't have to be different religions and races and genders. I just mean uh, multiple people with different perspectives that like a candidate. So that way it's not singling out maybe one leader that could also have unconscious bias. That, that's actually a, a really good point. But I think taking that a step further and going back to what I just said, I, I think we need to really relook at the way we create job descriptions yeah. because to me, job descriptions are made with assumptions. I assume they need to have this or look like this or have, now I don't mean physically look, but but have you know these this set of competencies because the last person in the job had that. Well, what about the 18 people before or and doing the job as well that don't have that? So right. there's all- yeah. You make a great point on social media saying, does that person really need to have 20 years of experience, you know, or, or be this age or level to do this job? And another point we were learning, do they really have to be in person if they're thriving remotely right now? Half of our job descriptions have certain requirements that we're not even enforcing. And, you know, now we should probably throw out the window and reevaluate and change what our job, do they really have to be there from nine to five constantly? Or are they getting their work done? 
in other hours. These are things we got to revisit. And if we don't change them, we're going to get sued for, you know, having policies we're not enforcing and potentially are discriminating against women who may need that flexibility or the stay at home debt. Yeah, I, I think there's a whole kind of a whole hour that we can spend just on. Let's talk about how we but by in the past have created job descriptions what's wrong with it and how do we alleviate that and that's probably something that we should we should talk about because the hr community we keep getting questions about it we just haven't had enough of them um haven't enough differentiators in some of the questions so we haven't talked a ton about it but i i think this is going to become a big issue in 2021 big big yeah. big issue and you mentioned the age thing you know needing somebody hey i need somebody with 20 years of experience do you do you really why what do you expect them to know and I've said this before, if somebody with seven years of experience has already learned that and can already do that, who might actually be the better candidate? The one it took 20 years to get there or the one to learn the same thing and better in seven years? There's a whole different mindset on that. You're 100% right. And, you know, it, it does beg the question, is that really age discrimination? Are, are they doing reverse? <laughs> are they saying you, you're not going to get respected unless you're of a certain age? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's unfair, too to some of the folks that have really busted their butt to do more in a shorter period of time. And it's kind of like, they're not, they're no longer being rewarded for it. They're actually being penalized for achieving more in a, in a, in a shorter period of time. Yeah. So, hey, I got a compensation related question. Um, and it's kind of a philosophical question, I think. So here, here's a question. Our leadership team is compensated based on their department performance. So operations, this, sales, this, you know, whatever the case is but they're now working against each other to ensure their departments succeed at any cost. Any recommendations on how to avoid this or on structure? It's a huge issue. I see that again and again and again, where there's some department that sends a, a firm wide email, how great you know this, this Joe or Sally did. And then these other departments don't say anything, but maybe they have rock stars. And then the people feel like, one's better than the other and money that goes here could mean less money there. It's a huge disaster. Uh, I think you got to relook at compensation and relook at teamwork and, and look at the type of behavior that you want to reward and not allow people to circumvent your intentions and work against each other. So I, what I'm seeing, you know, in a lot of sense is sharing various credit. If both departments were part of growing that piece Let's share the credit in both departments and not just say only one can benefit and the other one can't get anything. I think evaluate equity. I think you want to allow people to, to share maybe uh, their point of view as to why they think that there's merit there. Yeah, I got, I got kind of two, two points of view on this whole thing. One, compensate. you will get what you, re you require and you will get what you measure. So if you, if you measure... And, and comp based on individual company perform or individual team performance, you're gonna get individual team performance in most cases, but unfortunately sometimes it's at any cost. So I, I just recently had this conversation with somebody who's struggling. It's not the same person, I don't think, but but going through the same thing. And I, you played sports in, in high school and college, didn't you, yeah. James? Yeah. And I always ask this question. If you think about, you've heard me ask this question actually. If you, if you think about the best team you were ever on, what, what words come to mind? right? Teamwork. We all watched out for each other. And there's this thing around what I call shared fate. Everybody knows the objective and everybody knows how to measure the objective. So let's say football. What's the goal in football? Win. How do you measure it? The score. Oh my gosh. One win, one score, not individual performance of the team. And I, I, I think there's something that, that needs to be looked at from an HR and from a, a leadership and compensation perspective around are we, are we rewarding individual performance more, but yet expecting overall team performance? Because you get what you expect, you get what you measure, you get what you compensate. And it just seems to me that there's something wrong with the way we're, we're trying to figure this thing out when it comes to comp and, and other stuff like that. I think we've got the model wrong and I think we've had it wrong for a hundred years. I agree with you, and I heard Simon Sinek do a Vistage presentation last week on this, and what if you're bringing in 400 new clients and you have all this work in the pipeline, but it didn't actually collect by the date of your bonus period, you give that person nothing, and the person that didn't bring in any new clients for 10 years just has some existing clients that other people service, they should make 10 times more money. 
yes, that's unfair. It doesn't make sense, but it's also hard to how to quantify a future pipeline. So it, it's a challenge that I think you're smart. We need to at least spot the issue and figure out if there's a better way. Yeah, I, there's, there's no doubt that there's a better way. It's just going to take some significant change in trade-offs that it's going to be difficult for some companies to, to be able to do. So two final questions. One is, one is a, a bit more generic again, and one, one is actually a question about you, James, that, just, okay. uh, that I've gotten now twice. Um, okay. So it's probably somebody that we know is my guest, but I'm going <laughs> to ask it anyways. Um, okay. But the, the first one's kind of more generic. From an HR perspective, where, where do you see some of the biggest missed opportunities for HR right now? And the, and the comments around here are technologies, tools, strategies, and so on. And I know you're a you're, a, you're more of a, a legal expert in the HR field, but you're spending a ton of time with HR professionals. Generally speaking, where do you see the biggest missed opportunity right now? Every HR person I, I seem to interview, they tell me they have this specialty, whether it's strategic HR or labor or you know benefits and, and compensation. And I feel like to be too laser focused on one individual niche and not continuing your education in multiple things, uh, you're missing the boat there. And I also think that HR is too, I think, um, specialized where they're not actually playing the corporate game as often with getting to know every single leader and playing that political uh, growing to CHRO internally. A lot of the people I see in HR seem comfortable in their position and aren't necessarily uh, finding a way to get to the C-suite and vice versa. I don't think the HR people have identified all of the trusted advisors and specialists that could make them shine brighter. And I think they should, need to be a mini CEO and think, you know, what trusted advisors could I get either internally or externally to allow me to have better data and do my job better and make smarter decisions. So I think that take advantage of resources is a key theme. Yeah, I, I, the only other one I would add to that is, is I th and I've seen some, especially here in, in the local market, I've seen some really strong HR professionals who do this. It, it, there's something to be said about how you talk, right? So well, there's what I call HR speaker in the recruiting world, recruiting speaker in your world, there's legal speak, right? But yeah. then there's something about business speak, which tends to be a little bit different. And we've got to figure out a way to bridge some of those things a little bit better. I think there's a huge opportunity for our HR leaders to, to kind of up their own game, not because they don't know it, but by changing the way in which they talk about it and almost become more relevant with the CEO and the other leaders within the organization. There's some doing it exceptionally well. I think they should be teaching some of those that aren't doing it. That's a great point. I, I should have said that to talk to the different pillars within the company, the, the CFO type of talk and the HR talk is a different almost language and they got to learn how to synergize across the different pillars of an organization. Yeah, no, no question about that. So here's the last question because we're coming up on, on the new now. We're yeah. trying to keep these just under an hour. Um, and this, this is why I said, I think it's somebody that we probably know. So, so you were, you just started your term as president of my Sherm. That's right. I, it's, uh, and I'm glad that you're here to help the resource partners and resources to give to me so that I can analyze data and see how to be value. Uh, with the 19 HR chapters. Okay, so here's here's the question that's coming out. James, you're an attorney. The the Sherm the the entire Sherm organization is all about HR professionals. Why are you doing that? <laughs> and what, yeah, yeah, I feel that it allows me to understand the issues that thousands of companies are going through uh, before there's lawsuits where I'm seeing it after the fact. My whole a philosophy and mission of my practice is solve issues when there's smoke before there's the wildfire. So I'm trying to audit my clients' issues, resolve them, and not just get the litigation after there's already a disaster of culture and violations at a company. So thank you, HR, for sharing all of the issues with me and allowing me to, to fix them for uh, anyone that will hear our educational presentations. Yeah, and I, and I think that goes both ways. It goes, it goes back to actually what we were talking about when we started this thing is seeing it from somebody else's shoes, putting yourself into their shoes to see it. I think they have the HR community here, specifically here in Michigan, has that opportunity with you and, and others, and you have that opportunity to see it from their perspective. So I, I thought that's what your answer would be, but yeah. because I got hit twice with it in the last couple of minutes, I, I figured, I, I, let I me like ask it. the question. <laughs> I, I want to ask it back at you. Uh, what's the... Uh, 
benefit of you know scrounging all of these resource partners together and and how do you help uh, the state of Michigan yeah I, I mean from my perspective I've been focused on educating the HR community with as many uh, kind of business related items as possible and and I think that HR often gets the the, the crap right I, I just I think because of the role that they play they get beat up quite a bit and I don't think they they should they deserve to be beat up that way so if there's things that we can provide them with to help them do their jobs more effectively different ways of looking at things i focus a lot on leadership in general because that's that's been my experience the last 20 years um, if that helps them that's what i want to be able to do so that that's really my focus i think that's great but thank you for asking so it's it's 11:55. I, I think let's let's wrap this thing up. Couple of things for those of you that are watching. James and I do this live once a month. Um, we answer your questions. You can email us. You can post in the chat. You can put in social media the questions that you have. If you want to be completely anonymous, you can go to qualagents.com and you can put it there. You can text James. James, your cell phone is seven three four six four nine one three one three. My cell number is 734-837-8500. We won't ask you for your name or any of that. So you've got ways to do this without bringing attention to who you are. I mean, we're trying to get the real conversation out there about some of these things. It's two people's opinions. I get it. But you'll also realize that, that we're, not, we're not beating around the bush with some of these things. And they're not always popular opinions. And James and I and some of our, our guests have uh, not agreed on, on stuff. And, and I think that's that's what we're trying to show, especially in light of the division in the country today. We don't all have to agree on, on everything. We just need to have some common discourse about it. We can agree to disagree. We, we can, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, come on, let, let people. So yeah. if you want to get involved, if you've got something, some value to add to the show and you want to get on this and, and have the conversation live and put in your two cents like we've had others, reach out to one of us. Again, you can reach out at qualagents.com, uh, just look for the leadership and, and legal live, or you can do it in social media and somebody from the team will actually reach out to you. And I think we're, we're in the third week of February for our next event, James. Exactly, we just booked that date. Yep, looking forward to that. And you, we also encourage you to go to the michigansherm.org website. Uh, Steve and I will be adding a lot more content and videos and an agenda of what to expect for the rest of the year. Yeah, and just so we're going to be adding the dates as well um, uh, that we're going to be do for at least the next six months of our leadership and lives. We've been doing it kind of 30 days at a time. Though in the next week or two, those will all be up there on the site. Um, but if again, if you want to play a role, if you've got questions, please reach out. James, thank you again. It's uh, it's always good to see you. It's like it's like I see you every day now. Right, social media makes it easier to to hang out. Yeah, but I but I think it's conversations that that need to happen in all in all seriousness. So. If you're watching again live, thank you for watching. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for your questions. If you're watching this recorded, thank you again for your time. Share this with those that you think need to see it. Um, and and if, you, if you need that legal counsel, which I believe at this point uh, everybody does, reach out to James directly. Um, he's been a great resource for us and for many of the clients that, that we have and many folks that, that we know. So with that, I will say goodbye, James. Thank you again, and, and we'll say goodbye, goodbye to you as well. Thank you. We'll talk soon. All right. We'll see you later.